Okay, so what we're going to be taking a look at now is just a progression of this central limit theorem. We've already taken a look that, hey, our sample mean x bar is going to be normally distributed if our assumptions are met. What we're going to be taking a look at here is another sample, and in this case here, another sample statistic rather, and in this case we'll be taking a look at the sample proportion. And in this case, our sample proportion really is coming from our whole binomial approximation of the normal, or sorry, rather the normal approximation of the binomial. Got that mixed up there. So in this case here, keep in mind, when we were approximating the binomial with the normal, we were approximating a discrete distribution, that is, x itself was discrete. But what we can do is we can go and say, well, x might be discretely distributed, right? So maybe as a binomial. If we go and do this, x over n, we get a what we'll call a sample proportion such that x over n, well, this guy here, this is continuously distributed, right? So x may be discrete. We may have a situation where we're, say, counting how many blue sky days there are. But if we were to work out the proportion of blue sky days, p e bar, that would be a continuous random variable. So big distinction happening there. Number of blue sky days, discrete. Proportion of blue sky days, continuous. What we can get away with then is we can say, hey, look at this. For this discrete random variable, right, if it was binomial, binomial distributed, and it had NP, NQ, both of these guys were greater than five, right? Well, hey, in that case there, we said that we could approximate the binomial using a normal centered around our mean, NP, and with a standard deviation of NPQ. Okay, so let's work through this transformation. So let's suppose that we had some random variable x, which was discrete, right? So this was our binomial case. We had some sample size and we had some pr probability of success in one trial. But let's say that instead of working out, hey, what our value of x is, we wanted to figure out instead, okay, we don't wanna go this whole discrete route. We wanna go x over n to work out what we would call our p bar, our sample proportion. Well, okay, let's back up. Let's take a look and say, hey, this x discrete, if n was, well, if n, p, n, q was greater than or equal to five, this discrete random variable would be approximately normal. And it would be centered around Right? This is just our normal approximation of the binomial. It would be centered around the mean, which we could calculate as NP. Right, Remember that? Mean of a binomial was NP. And right, we have that right here. We have the standard deviation of NPQ. So our standard deviation of X is NPQ. And we're taking the square root of all that. Okay, so now we want to say, great, that's our case there. Let's switch this to being, instead of x, let's switch this to be in terms of p bar. That is, all we've done is we've taken our x and we've divided it by n, our sample size. So, okay, if we've divided x by n, we've also divided our mean by n. So what do we have here? n over n, those cancel each other out. We're going to get a new distribution of p bar. We could just carry that point there down. And not quite lined up, but we'll presume that that is symmetric around the mean, such that we are now centered around P. This here is, okay, we can put it as P. I'm going to change this notation shortly, so don't get too attached to it. But P, our probability of success, right? Our true proportion of successes that we witness in the population on whole. What about the standard deviation? Well, our standard deviation is going to be standard deviation of p bar now. So we'd call that our standard error again. 
and that's going to be n p q all over n right we're just dividing everything by n that's how we got our sample proportion that's how we got our new mean same thing to get our standard deviation we can do some algebraic manipulation here to simplify this a little bit so let's go take a look at that so we have npq that's the same thing as saying n to the half power p to the half power q to the half power right instead of putting the radical around the whole thing or raising the whole thing to the half power it's the same thing as saying each one individually is to the half power all times n right so that was our standard deviation of p bar or our standard error Okay, we have n up in the numerator, we have n down in the denominator. This is n to the 1, right? We typically don't write that, but n to the 1 is just itself. So we have an exponent across a divisor. We can just subtract these guys, right? So this guy gets cancelled out altogether, and that knocks off half of that guy. So what are we left with? We are left with, let's go back to our radical notation, p q all over n right such that this whole thing is square rooted whole thing so we have our new let's just erase this and let's write our simplified version we have a standard error of p bar of n q oh sorry i had n on the brain p q all over n and now we have a normal distribution of our sample proportion centered around the true population proportion with this known standard error. So in this case here, if ever we're trying to work out a proportion, right, what's the proportion of successes we have? What's the prob, right? We could say, hey, what's the probability I have more than five blue sky days in a week if any one day has a 20% chance of being a blue sky day? Right, I can work through this in this kind of fashion and work out my probability of success based off of the normal. Based off of this fact that p bar, my sample proportion, will be normally distributed. Again, we have this condition, same as our binomial. All of our binomial conditions have to be met. np, nq, greater than or equal to 5. So if this is true, all our binomial conditions are true. That is, hey, we have two outcomes, success or failure. It either is a blue sky day or it's not a blue sky day. The events are independent of each other. Monday being blue sky doesn't affect Tuesday being blue sky. Yeah, maybe that's a bit of a stretch in our scenario here. But if we have independent events that have success, failure, we know how many trials we're running. We know the probability of success in any one trial. We can use this sample proportion. So again, if all our binomial conditions are met, we could, we could approximate the binomial with the normal. Well, then we could also convert that into a proportion and from that proportion, work out a probability. Let's take a look at an example of this just so that we're comfortable working through this. And we'll work through a few of these. Okay, so here we have an example of how we would utilize the sample proportion in order to Find out a probability. So here we have that Statistics Canada is reporting that uh, Victoria has the highest proportion of users utilizing active transportation in the country at 17%. Right? So that is 17% of people who live in Victoria walk, bike, use transit in order to get to school or work. Okay, so based off of that, we want to know, hey, what's the probability of pulling out a random sample of 30 people? And finding that between 10 and 20 percent of them use active transportation so okay keep in mind typically in these kind of questions again typically this is the way that they work up in the top here we have our context right we have a bit of information that is needed to us and then the second part or sometimes it's all combined and it's just the last sentence this is our actual question itself so kind of good thing to keep in mind Taking a look at this, I know right off the start that, hey, I have this in Canada, this proportion of 17% of users utilizing active transportation. So that is, I would use a value of pi of 
0.17. And you might be saying, whoa, 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 Keith, hold up. Where is this? Where's this pi coming from? Well, let's let's take a look at that. So keep in mind we said that hey, our sample proportion, p bar, which was just number of successes all over number of trials, was going to be normally distributed if NP and Q was greater than or equal to five. And we then said, hey, this guy here was centered around a value of P, but I said, hey, hey, don't get too attached to this notion of P there because we're gonna change it. Well, here we go. We're changing it just like how we had X bar as our sample mean. We have P bar as our sample proportion. We then, for our population parameter, X bar was mimicked by its population parameter mu, right? So sample mean, population mean, in much the same way where this is our sample proportion, our population proportion, that is the true population proportion altogether, the true proportion of people who use active transportation is pi, the Greek letter. Right, so population parameters are in Greek and sample in our standard letters. So that's where our pi comes from. Pi is the population proportion of what we would expect. And in this case here, right, we're saying that Stats Canada is saying that this is at 17%. Okay, we then have a standard deviation of our sample proportion, so this is our standard error, which is going to be the square root of p, so that is my 0 0.17, and q, so that's going to be 1 minus, right, the probability of failure. So in that case there, we get 1 minus, 1 minus 0.17, that's going to be 0 0.83, and then all over our sample size. So, okay, okay, what's our sample size? If you wanna know what would be the probability of surveying 30 people? So, okay, we're pulling out a survey or we're conducting a survey such that N equals 30. So, okay, there we go. That's our N, that's our sample size. We have our standard error. Okay, great. We've kind of gotten ahead of ourselves though. We don't even know if we can do this. We don't even know if N, P, and Q is large enough in order to be able to conduct this. So in order to do this, what we need to do is we need to work out, hey, what is 30 times 0.17 and what is 30 times 0 0.83? So, okay, we can, we can work that out. 30 times 0.17, that gives me 5.1, oh, just makes it. And then 30 times 0.83, that should give me quite a good number, 24.9. So, okay, we're safe, right? We're greater than or equal to that five. We can carry on by assuming that our sample proportion is gonna be normally distributed. What are we asking now? Well, we're looking at the probability of taking this random sample of 30 and finding that between 10 and 20 people, sorry, 10 and 20% of our sample uses active transportation. So, right, we're asking a question about a proportion. We're asking a question about a proportion. 10% of users, 20% of users. So, okay, where, where would this fall? 10%, well, that's going to be less than our true population proportion. So we'll put that something like there. And 20%, that's going to be just a bit bigger. So 20%, we'll put that guy there. And we're interested in the probability that we're between 10 and 20. So let's shade all of this in here. There we go. This is the probability we're looking for. Between 10 and 20%. Okay. Just like with x, just like when we're dealing with our sample mean x bar and the central limit theorem, we can't do anything with our random variable directly. 
we always have to standardize it. We always have to turn it into, transform it into a Z. And same thing being said here. P bar, our sample proportion, will need to be standardized into a Z. And again, it's like, oh my goodness, another formula. No, 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 it really isn't, right? It, yes, okay, it is, but no, it isn't. Let's say we want to take a look at what I'll just temporarily call Z1, what this 0, 0.10 is. Well, Z1, always our standardization process. I'm going to take my random variable of interest. So 0 0.10, right? That was P bar. I'm then going to subtract that from the mean. 0 0.17. Seven. That was my true population proportion, right? So random variable minus population proportion. I'm then going to divide all of this by my standard errors. So in this case here, my standard errors, oh, those look ugly. That's going to be 0 0.17, 0 0.83, all over my sample size of 30. That is my standard error of P bar. So, okay, if we wanted to just kind of write that in a bit of a concise way, let's do that over here. We could say that, hey, if we wanted to have an actual formula, our standardization for our sample proportion would be P bar minus pi all over pi. Technically, that guy there is going to be Q, so 1 minus pi all over n, all right? That's what we've just worked out here. So we could work this out in this way, and we now have, uh, if you want, a formula that you can call, right? A formula that you can call. But keep in mind, if you start thinking about, oh my goodness, it's a new formula, every time we do this, you're gonna start getting into this mindset of, okay, what formula do I need in this situation? When in fact, our standardization process is always random variable, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That is, how far have I deviated? How far have I deviated from the mean? And then divide by a standard deviation or a standard error. So let's work this out. What do I get in this case? I get negative 0 0.07 all over, that guy's gonna be a fun one to calculate. So 0 0.17 times 0.83. And then take that guy, divide it by 30, and then put the whole thing, take the square root of that. That's going to give me 0. Point, I will carry around a few extra decimal places here, 0. 0.0686. So, okay, let's work that out. We got 0. 0.07 divided by 0. 0.0686. That's going to give me a z of negative 1.02. Let's just erase that z1 there, and there we go, negative 1.02. We want to find z2 then. Well, much the same way. All right, let's, uh, let's just change colors for z2 so they don't kind of meld into each other too much. z2 is going to be my random variable of interest, so 0 0.20 minus my mean. 0 0.17 all over my standard errors. Now, this is where I can take advantage of the fact that I already calculated these standard errors to be 0 0.0686. I don't need to recalculate that, right? Now that I have it, I have it. I can utilize that again because it's constant. It's not changing throughout this. So I get 0 0.2 minus 0 0.17. That's going to give me 0 0.03. Might as well write that down. 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.0686. 0 0.03 divided by my standard errors, 0 0.0686. That will give me a value of Z2 of 0 0.43. Uh, that's not true, 437. So two decimal places for our Z statistics, 0 0.44. Okay, now that I have these guys, I want to find out what the probability is, right, in each case, 
between the mean and my z and between the mean and my z. So to do that, I need to go to my z table, right? My standard normal table. And again, we can look that up in the back of the OpenStax textbook. I have one in this case just over on the next page, so let's just take a look at that. So what are we looking at? We're looking for 1.02. So 1.02, we're going to go down the left side till we get to 1.0. We're then going to go over till we get to 1.02. That's going to give me 0 0.3461. Zero point three four six one. So a thirty four point six one percent chance that I fell between ten percent and seventeen percent. What about this blue guy here? What do we have there? Point four four. So we go down the left side, zero point four over two point four. And that's going to yield 17%, 0 0.1700. Okay, the entire red area here is this guy plus this guy. So working those two together, we get 0.3461 plus 0.17, giving me my probability... We'll just go express it this way. Hey, this probability here, these two guys together, is going to be 0 0.5161. Meaning that, hey, if we surveyed 30 people, there's a 51.61% chance that 10 to 20% of them would be using active transportation. So pretty good chance, right? Pretty good chance in that case there. Okay, example one with our sample proportion. Introduction, we kind of saw it. I'd recommend that you try to work through this one on your own as well, right? Back up, rewind the video, see if you can work through this guy on your own. Well, let's take a look at another one, another example of this sample proportion. Again, now that we've had the initial walkthrough, first, before I start doing it, pause it, see if you can work through it on your own, and then I'll work through it as well. So let's go through the question first. It is reported that 5% of in vehicles in Canada are PEV, that's plug-in electric vehicles. The Capital Regional District, so here the Greater Victoria area, performs a survey and finds that of the 3,112 surveyed, 5.8% own an electric vehicle. We want to know what is the probability of pulling out this sample result or one more extreme. Okay, so what's going on here? We have percentages showing up. We're looking at proportion of people who have a plug-in electric vehicle. This is a proportion question, right? So we have some question of P bar. What we then have is we start pulling out information from here. So the first thing that I want to pull out is that I have a sample size of 3,112. All right, that's the survey that we conducted. We then have, uh-oh, we have two proportions. We have, it is reported that 5% in Canada, but also 5.8% in the CRD. Which one of these, right, this is a problem, which one of these is my population proportion and which one is my sample proportion? Well, okay, in this case here, it is reported that 5% of vehicles in Canada, right? So this is Canada on whole. This is the greater area, all of it. The Capital Regional District is part of Canada and we perform a survey, our own sample of 3,112 and we find that we have a sample proportion of 0 0.058. Okay, all right, hopefully that made sense, right? Canada, the big one, all together, we performed our own sample, our own survey of 3,012, 3,112, and obtained our sample proportion from it, all right? That distinction there. And that's important to be able to pull that out of the question. From here, we're gonna say, okay, we're dealing with P-bar, so we want to take a look at can we norm can we treat this as a normal distribution? So that is is NP is NQ greater than or equal to five. 
And in this case here, 5% of 3,112, oh, I think we're probably good. That there, NP, that gives me 155.6, meaning NQ is going to give me something like 2,900. So yeah, I'm, I'm good to deal with this as a normal. So let's take a look then. We have p-bar. p-bar normally distributed, centered around my population proportion. So centered around 5%. Standard deviation or the standard error p-bar is going to be a probability of success, so 0 0.05. Probability of failure, 0 0.9. Five, all over my standard errors, 3,112. Okay, great, we have our initial setup, right? Technically, I didn't even have to go into my question yet in order to get this. That was just everything in the initial context. Now to the questions. What is the probability of pulling out this sample result or one more extreme? Okay, what sample result? The sample result of 5.8% or more extreme. So, okay, where was that 5.8%? Hey, if this is 0 0.05, 5.8 is going to be something like that or more extreme. So, more extreme meaning farther in the tail, right? In this case, it's bigger, so more extreme is to the right. If it was smaller, more extreme would be farther into that left hand tail. Okay, again, we can't do anything with the random variable itself. We can't do anything with this sample proportion. What we have to do, we have to take it, we have to standardize it from p bar to a z. So, okay, yeah, this guy here, that's going to drop down to become zero. We need to work out what does 0 0.058 work out to be. So again, our standardization formula is figuring out how far this guy is deviated from our mean. So 0 0.058 minus 0 0.05 divided by a standard error. So we can work that out. Z is going to be our random variable, 0 0.058 minus the mean of the distribution, 0 0.05, all over a standard error. So the standard error in this case is the square root of 0 0.05. 0 0.95 all over 3,112. Okay, so working that out in our numerator, we have 0 0.058 minus 0 0.05, giving me pretty tiny number, 0 0.008. Okay, what's this denominator work out to? We have 0.05 times 0.95 divided by 3,112. That gives me an exceptionally tiny number. Let's take the square root of it. And that yields for me a denominator of 0 0.00, uh, we'll go 39. We could round that to 0, 004, but let's keep the, uh, let's keep the accuracy 39. So the Z statistic altogether, 0 0.008 divided by 0 0.0039 gives me Z value of 2.05. So 2.05 there, that's my Z statistic. Great, have that, not yet done. My next step is I need to work out what's the probability that's attached to this Z that is, what's the probability between my mean and the Z statistic that I just calculated? So let's go back to that Z table. Let's look this guy up and let's work out that probability. So we just had 2.05. So down the left-hand side to 2.0 over 2.05. So 2.0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that gives me 0.4798. So the probability of witnessing between 5% and 
was 47.98. Keep in mind, this is not what we're looking for, right? We're not looking for this yellow area. We're looking for the red area. So we need to invoke is the fact that our normal distribution is symmetric. That is the mean is the median. So all the way from that mean out to infinity is going to be 50%. If that is all 50%, well then, hey, if we go 0.5 minus 0.4798, we get our red area, right? The leftover in that case. That red area, that has a probability of 0 0.0202. That is, if the true population proportion of plug-in electric vehicles is 5%, and we get a sample survey of 5.8%, well, that's a very unlikely result, right? That's a very unlikely result to have witnessed, meaning it's likely the case that here in Victoria, we have a higher proportion than the national average of plug-in electric vehicles, right? And if you drive around on the streets, that's probably true. That's probably true. So how we worked that out and a little bit of an aside as to how we can, how we can interpret it. Okay. Two examples of the proportion. We worked out those. Um, let's take a look at that next bullet point there. What would have been the probability of pulling out a sample which showed between 4.8 and 5.14% of those sample drove a plug-in electric vehicle? So, okay, let's, let's make some room. Okay, in this case here, I no longer have this value of P bar, right? I'm no longer saying, hey, what's the probability of 0 0.058? So we could just kind of go, yep, yeah, that was the old question. That guy's gone. What we're looking at now is saying, hey, what's the probability that our sample was between 4.8 and 5.14? So let's throw that in. 4.8, that's to the left of my mean. So let's put that somewhere like that. 0 0.048 and then 5.14. Uh, 5.14 is going to be maybe something like that. Again, it's not really all too important where we put this, more just hey, is it to the left or is it to the right of the mean? Okay. In each of these cases, what we're looking for, in this case, we're not looking for the tail, we're not looking for more extreme, we're saying, hey, what's the probability we're between this value and that value? So we want all of this in this case. We're looking for the middle bit. We're looking for the middle bit. Okay. Can't do anything with the random variable itself. Again, what we need to do, if we want to do anything with this question, we need to convert this into a Z. So always our first step from P bar into a Z. We need to standardize it. And we'll standardize Z1, we'll standardize Z2. So let's work out Z1 first. Again, what is our formula? Random variable minus the mean, so we're figuring out what our deviation is, divided by a standard error. So, okay, to work through that, we have Z1, 0 0.048 minus 0 0.05 all over a standard error. Now, what did I work out that standard error to be? That standard error, right, if we recall, we were just playing around with that. This guy here was 0 0.0039. So just write that down, then I don't have to recalculate it each time, right? There we go. Save us some work. So, okay, in that case there, let's work out our numerator. 0 0.048 minus 0 0.05, that's going to give me negative 0 0.002. Oh, that's a zero. All over this, 0 0.0039. So what does that give us for our z? Negative 0 0.002 divided by 0 0.0039. I get negative 0 0.51. So there we go. That's my z statistic, 0 0.51. Keep in mind that guy there drops down to give us 0. 
Well, let's take a look at Z2. What's going on with Z2 there? 0.0514. Ah, let's again use a different color for this guy. Just so things don't meld together too much. We have 0 0.0514 minus 0 0.05 all over, uh, what was my standard error? 0 0.0039. Okay, so in the numerator, that's going to give me 0 0.0014 all over 0 0.0039. That's going to give me, as a z-statistic, 0.3589, so two decimal places, 0 0.36. Great, we have our z-statistics. Now that we have our z-statistics, we need to go and work out what the attached probability is. Keep in mind, right, when we go to our table, that's the probability of this guy. And that's the probability of that bit, always between our Z statistic of interest and the mean. So let's go back to our table and take a look there. Let's start off with that 0 0.51. So going down the left side, 0 0.51 gives me 0 0.1950. Ah, uh, 0 0.36, go down to 0 0.3. Over, we have 0 0.36 as 1406. There we go. We're looking for these two together, so we're just going to add them together. And that's going to give us 0 0.1950 plus 0 0.1. 406, and that will give us a probability of 0 0.3356. Meaning that, hey, if that national proportion of plug in electric vehicles is 5%, the probability that we survey Victorians and find that, hey, we get a probability of plug in vehicles between 4.8 and 5.14. Well, there's a 33% chance of getting those results. So we can work that out in this case as well. Okay, so we've had a few examples now with our sample proportion. Hopefully you're fairly comfortable looking through it, working through it. The problem that ends up happening though is how do you figure out what type of question you're dealing with? It's easy in this case where it's just, hey, Boom, we just introduced sample proportions. Let's work through an example of it. Clearly, that's what we're doing. But what happens if we just haven't introduced it, if it's an exam situation and all these questions are just jumbled together? How do you figure out which tool you're utilizing out of the toolbox? Well, let's take a look at a bit of a flow chart that we can utilize to kind of work through this. So, a bit of a flow chart in this case. What we need to do, right, we have a bunch of different tools available to us. First, we have the fact that, okay, X could be discrete. If X is discrete, right, the result of counting, well, X could either be binomial distributed or Poisson distributed. And we could use our discrete kind of cases in each one. So, okay, just as we went back several videos again, uh, just worked out the discrete probability distribution. What we can also do is if X is discrete and it's binomial, if we have n, p, n, q greater than or equal to 5, we could also approximate the binomial with the normal, right? We could do the normal approximation, such that, right, in that case there, we would have x being normally distributed, centered around n, p, with a standard deviation of n, p, q. So first kind of thing we need to flow through when we think about these questions, Am I dealing with a discrete variable? Am I dealing with a continuous variable? If it's discrete, well, I have to flow through that way. Kind of say, okay, am I just dealing with a straight discrete probability distribution? Or is it going to be easy to approximate a binomial with a normal? That's kind of the way we think about things. On the continuous side, 
Okay, on the continuous side, we have three possibilities so far, right? And we'll have more as we carry on. On the continuous side, our three possibilities are is that we're dealing just directly with x, right? We're asking a question directly about x itself, such that x itself is normally distributed. So, hey, we assume x is normally distributed with some mean, some standard deviation. What's the probability we pull out a single observation of x and find that it's in this range, right? So in that case there, we're just pulling out a single continuous variable and we want to know the probability it's within a given range. Alternatively, we could be asking a question about the sample mean. In this case, it's typically worded like, hey, what's the probability that given a sample of five, we find an average between this value and that value? Right, so again, always in terms of a range because we're dealing with continuous distribution here, but we're going to have a sample being pulled out. Like I pull out 10 and what's the probability of something happening? Right, big kind of hint with that. If we take a look at this distribution, X is normally distributed with mu and sigma. There's no N needed. There's no sample size needed here. In this case, distribution of X bar, we need to know the sample size. Right, we need to know the sample size for our standard errors. So if a sample size is given, well, it's probably this guy here. What we need to do, we need to make sure that we have a large enough sample size. So again, n greater than three, if my population is assumed to be normal. n greater than 10, if my population is assumed to be symmetric. And finally, I need a sample size of at least 30, if I have no idea as to what my population is, right? So anytime we're bigger than 30, we're just golden. We can go on no matter what. Anytime we're less than 30, we have to start looking at our assumptions. So conditions to be met to utilize our central limit theorem are normal distribution of our sample mean. Finally, final one that we just introduced underneath continuous, we can have a sample proportion. Okay, in this case here with the sample proportion, all the language is going to be in terms of proportions, percentages. You're not going to see any language about mean, average. You're not going to see any language about a standard deviation. All the information you'll be given will be sample sizes and proportions. No standard deviations, right? Because keep in mind, here, you needed to know a standard deviation. Here, you needed to know a standard deviation. Over here, all you need to know is pi, pi, one minus pi, and our sample size, right? So in this case here, if we have a proportion, if we have a sample proportion, we're trying to find the probability of an event, well, we're going to be over in this world, and you're only going to know pi and n, and everything else you can work out from that. Again, our conditions to be met. Well, you need to have your binomial conditions met. Only two possible outcomes, success and failure. They're mutually exclusive, they're independent, and NP, NQ are greater than or equal to five. Okay, so that's our flowchart. Going forward for the remainder of this video, all we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be working through a series of examples that is gonna be one out of these possible tools, right? And what we'll do is we'll introduce the question, and I'd highly recommend, I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video, I'd highly recommend that you work through this flowchart or you work through a similar kind of idea in your head to see if you can correctly identify which route we're going down. Right, once you figure out what route you're going down, it's always the same thing. What's my random variable? What's the probability attached to that random variable? Right, so rest of my random variable, standardize it from that standardization, that Z statistic, calculate the probability, report the probability. Right, the toughest part, seriously, the toughest part is getting which one are we utilizing. Are we dealing with x, x bar, p bar, or x discrete? What's going on? Let's take a look at an example. Okay, so we'll take a look at, again, context. And in this case here, question one. We'll just take a look at question one to start off with because they're actually very different. Okay, so context. On a full tank of gas, you have, on average, 400K to empty, according to the manufacturer, with a standard deviation of 25K. 
the distribution of these ranges is assumed to be normal. So, okay, we're saying that, hey, our range that we can travel on our vehicle is approximately normal. What's our actual question? You pull out a sample of 25 and find that you have been getting, on average, 410k per tank. What is the probability of getting this result or more? So, okay, what we can do so far is we can just kind of write down the information we know. So from the context, our manufacturer has stated that we get an average of 400. That's from the manufacturer, that's the statement, that's kind of saying for the population on whole, that's that we have a mean of 400. Farther, we have a standard deviation of 25. Okay, just from what's being given to me so far, kilometers, right, K. Okay. That's a continuous random variable. So I know instantly that I'm over on that right-hand zone. Right now, what I'm trying to differentiate between is, am I dealing with a question about x, or am I dealing with a question about x bar? Both need the mean, both need the standard deviation. I am not dealing with a question about the sample proportion. And I know that because I have a standard deviation and a mean being given to me, right? And my units of measurement are kilometers, not a proportion of successes. So I know that it's not a p-bar. Okay, from that, what's our next step? Into the question, this will help us to kind of work things out. You pull out a sample of 25. Okay. Big thing is that we pull out a sample of 25 and we find that on average, so okay, we've got an average from our sample, that is a sample average is X bar, we've been getting 410 kilometers. And we're saying what's the probability of witnessing this result or more? So okay, all of this, just simply by the fact that I have an N and that I have, hey, this word here on average, well, that's really good hints that I'm dealing with central limit theorem. I have this situation occurring. So, okay, I've narrowed it down to be X bar. Next question I need to ask, right, if we go and take a look at our flow chart. So, boom, we know we're happy that we're dealing with X bar. I now need to say, what are my sample sizes? Do I have large enough sample size? Well, I have a sample size of 25. Okay, not quite 30, so I have to kind of go through my list and say, are my assumptions met? Okay, if n is greater than or equal to 10, I just need a symmetric distribution. What is my distribution right now? The distribution of these ranges is assumed to be normal. Okay, so hey, in this case here, I could have gotten away with a sample size just bigger than 3. So in this case here, sample size of 25, I'm laughing, I've got tons going on. I'm great, great, so we're good to carry on. So carrying on then, we're gonna have X bar, my average distance traveled per tank, is going to be normally distributed, centered around my population mean of 400. I'm gonna have a standard deviation of 25, but okay, keep in mind, this is X bar. So my standard error of X bar is the standard deviation of X all over the square root of N. So that's gonna be standard deviation of X is 25 all over my sample size, also 25. So all over the square root of 25. So okay, that'll be 25 over five. This is nice and easy. I can just do it in my head. There we go. I'm gonna have a standard error of Five. Great. Now, what am I asking? I've pulled out a value of x bar of 410. So let's put that somewhere like this. And I want to know, hey, what's the probability of getting that result or more? So the probability that I witnessed 410 or greater, all of this guy, all the way out there to positive infinity. Well, can't do anything with the random variable on its own. I need to convert this from x bar into a z. 
And again, you can go flipping through your notes and say, okay, what formula do I use in this case? All the time, all we're doing, take our random variable, subtract it from our mean, right? Find out what this deviation from my mean is. Once I have that deviation of mean, I'm going to divide it by my standard error. So Z is going to be 410 minus 400 all over my standard error of 5. Right? That would have been 25 over root 25, but I already solved it, so we're good. What is that? 10 over 5, that is 2.00. Okay. Once I have my Z statistic, I then need to go to my table to look up the probability between 2.00 and my mean. And so if we go and do that, down the left side, 2.00, I get 0.4772. So 47.72%. Great. This is not the area that I'm looking for. I am interested in greater than, I'm interested in all the way out to positive infinity. This line is what I want. So, okay, we use the case that from the median all the way out, all of that guy there, that is 50%. So if this whole left, or sorry, if this whole right-hand side is 50%, and just that bit is 47.72, this guy is our leftover. So what's our leftover then? 0.5 minus 0.4772, I get this leftover as 0 0.0228, or a 2.28% chance. So, okay, not very likely that we would have pulled out a average of 410k over 25 samples if this was true, but maybe we're really, really fuel efficient, right? Maybe we drop primarily drive downhill. Maybe we're very light on the accelerator. There is a chance we could obtain this, but uh, this is this is pretty unlikely. Okay, that was our first question. Again, big part with that is we figured out this was asking about an average X bar. Well, let's take a look at question two. So really the point in this is say, hey, from the same context, I could ask a very different question. And that probably really gave away this next part here. But let's work through this. Let's see if you can identify the random variable. Okay, so let's write down again our contextual information. So we know mean of 400 and standard deviation of 25. We're now in question two. On a long trip, there are two gas stations. One is 360K away and another is 395K away. What is the probability that trying to get to the second gas station, we run out of gas between the two? So, okay, what are we looking at here? We have presumably a full tank of gas. We are saying, hey, on average, I get 400K per tank. What's the likelihood that I run out of gas between 360 and 395K? Okay, going through this. Am I doing repeated sampling? Am I like, hey, I do this trip five times on average. What's the likelihood that I... No, 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 no. I'm just saying, hey, what's the likelihood that I run out of gas between this observation or that observation? Right? So in this case here, I'm saying, hey, what is the probability that 360 is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to 395. All right, that is, I'm just dealing with X itself. I'm not dealing with an average. I'm not dealing with the central limit theorem. This works, right? This only works because ranges are assumed to be normal. That is, my X variable itself is normally distributed. So, Okay, we're good. We can go and we can say, here is my X. Normally distributed, centered around 400 with a standard deviation of X equal to just 25. 
right? This isn't the central limit theorem. I'm not dealing with x bar. So it's not 25 over root 25. There's no sample size happening here. It's just sample size of one. And okay. Now what I need to work out is the probability that I run out of gas between 360 and 395 K. So that is what's the likelihood that I fall into this region. All right, keep in mind, I typically get 400 per tank. It's normally distributed, so sometimes I get less per tank, sometimes I get more per tank. What's the probability that the amount I get per tank is between these two, given my scenario? So, okay, can't do anything with x itself. We have to convert this to a z. So 395 will be z2, 360 will be z1. So, okay, z1. What am I doing? How do I standardize? Always the same process, right? Take our random variable, 360. Subtract it from our mean, 400. Divide it by a standard deviation. So 360 minus 400 all over standard deviation of 25. So what is that? That's going to be negative 40 over 25. That'll give me negative 1.60. Okay, and there we have that one. What about 395? Well, same idea. Z2. Ah, let's go use this guy over here. Z2 is going to be 395 minus 400 all over standard deviation of 25. So what is that going to be? Negative 5 over 25? That's going to give me negative 0 0.20. Okay. From here, what we're doing is we're taking a look at our table to say, hey, what's the probability between this guy and our mean? And what's the probability between this guy and our mean? So jumping to our table, we can take a look at that. Let's start off by looking up this 0 0.20. Down the left-hand side, 0 0.20, we get 0 0.0793. There we go. 0 0.0793 is the probability we get between this z value and our mean. What about this guy, z1? 1.60. Let's go take a look. Down the left hand side to 1.6, 0 is going to be 0 0.4452. 0 0.4452. So we have our two probabilities. We witness that, hey, they overlap each other here. What we're interested in is just the red area. So if we subtract them off from each other, we'll subtract off this yellow area. We'll make that yellow area disappear. So we'll go 0 0.4452 minus 0 0.0793. And all that will leave for us is that red area. So 0.4452 minus 0 0.0793, we get a 36 point, ah, uh, sorry, 0.3659 or a 36.59% chance that we run out of gas in those ranges. So there you go. Assuming that standard deviation of ranges, assuming that you, that's how much gas you get per tank, you can now work out, hey, if you're on a road trip, and you have one new sign showing up saying, hey, next service is between this and this K, you know your likelihood that you make it. Because just because your car says 400 K to empty, that's just a guess. That's just an average K to empty. Depending on your driving, depending on what you do, you may get more, you may get less. Just as we've shown here. So there we go. We've worked through two different examples. We've worked through one that was... Question one, 
This was looking at the distribution of x bar. Question two, that was looking at the distribution of x. And hopefully as we work through these, you saw the differences in the way that the question was asked. That kind of gave us the hint as to which random variable we were using. Well, let's carry on. Well, let's take a look at yet another example and see if we can work this out again. Okay, so in this time here, what's our question? Uh, context, last little sentence will be our actual question itself. So 50% of the time, I can find a parking spot at Camosun immediately. Over the course of two weeks, so two working weeks, so over the course of 10 days, what is the probability that I find a parking spot immediately on more than eight of these days? So, okay, thinking about this, what's my random variable of interest is finding a parking spot on more than eight days. So X being number of days I find a parking spot. Okay, in this scenario, are days continuous or are they discrete? Right, that is, would it make sense for me to say, hey, what's the probability that I find a parking spot on more than 8.5 of these days? Right, so what, on half of a day I found one? But it's not really making sense, right? So, okay, just reading this, I have a discrete situation. So given that this is a discrete situation, I have two options. This is either a Poisson or this is a binomial. If it's a Poisson, it would say that, hey, there's some average rate at which occurs over time and space. I'm not seeing that. If it's binomial, well, underneath a binomial, I'll have something about n, I'll have something about p, and something about x. That looks a lot better, right? In this case here, over 10 days, that's my number of trials. p, well, I'm saying, hey, 50% of the time, I find a parking spot. And x, what am I interested in? Hey, that I find a spot immediately on more than eight days. So that x is greater than eight. That is that, hey, x equals 9 or that x equals 10, right? Those would be the two scenarios that I'm looking for. Great. I have this. I now have to work out, what am I doing with it? Do I just want to do my binomial? It wouldn't be bad. I only have to work it out for these two, right? I could go, hey, what's the probability that x equals 9? What's the probability that x equals 10? and work through it in that way there. Wouldn't be too bad as well, at, at all. Could I use my normal approximation of a binomial? Well, we can check, right? We have NP, NQ needs to be greater than or equal to five. So what's NP? 10 times 0.5? Well, that's five. NQ, N times one minus 0.5? Well, that will be five as well. So, okay, we could use our normal approximation as well. In this case, well, okay, if we wanted to go through our actual one, this would give us a more exact answer. This would give us the exact answer, right? Such that in this case here, we would say, okay, we are going to be doing uh, 10 combinate 9 times our probability of success, 0.5 to our number of successes, 9. Probability of failure, 0.5 to our number of failures, 1. Very similarly, 10 combinate 10 times 0.5 to 10 successes and 0.5 to 0 failures. Wouldn't be that hard to work out. In this scenario, I just go through the binomial. It's fast, it's easy, and it gives us an exact answer. If I was saying instead, right over the course of 100 days, well, okay, I'd be going normal approximation for sure, right? But of course, that would then become 50 and 50. So definitely normal approximation. So what, what do we get here? What do we get here? Let's, let's work through this. So, okay, first thing to work out is the combinations for each. So 10 combinate 9, that's going to give me 10. 10 combinate 10, that'll give me 1. All right, just work through each of those on their own because, well, we need to use that function or that long formula to calculate it. Not that long, but using that functional format in your calculator, probably the best way to do it. After that, well, okay, what do we have? We have 0.5 to the power of nine. 
that's going to give me 0 0.001953. Uh, and then 0.5 to the 1, well, that's just going to be 0 0.5. So, okay, I have all of these guys here. Let's add them up. So, 10 times 0 0.001953 times 0 0.5 gives me uh, 0 0.00977. Probability that x equals 10. Well, okay, that's one. Uh, what's that guy? 0.5 to the power of 10. That's gonna be pretty small. Uh, that's gonna be 0 0.00097. And then this guy here, 0 0.5 to that's gonna be one. So what does that work out to? 0 0.000, three zeros this time, 977. So summation of the two, the probability that I get a parking spot on more than eight days, so the probability I get it in nine and 10 days, is going to be these two summed together. So plus 0 0.00977, there's about what? A 1% chance, 0 0.0107. All right, so not very likely that I would get a parking spot immediately on nine or 10 days of driving to work. So in this case, we have our discrete. Hopefully that was pretty obvious as we worked through this. And we could have, right, we could have done that either just straight using our binomial or by using our normal approximation of the binomial, right? With the normal approximation, we just satisfy our criteria it's going to be a rough approximation. And just for the practice, let's work through it. So we're gonna have X being normally distributed, approximately, and it's gonna be centered around the mean of the binomial, so around NP. We've already worked that out to be five. The standard deviation of X is gonna be square root of n p q so what's that going to be n p is 5 times q of 0.5 take the square root of all that we'll have a square root of 1.58 uh 58 we'll I'll carry around a few extra decimal places 1 1 I want to know, hey, what's the likelihood that I get a parking spot in more than eight days? So that there was this area that I'm looking for. But keep in mind, with our normal approximation of the binomial, we need to apply that continuity correction factor. So that is, I don't want to include eight. That is, I don't want to say, hey, more than eight days, boom, that way. No, 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 no. I want that continuity correct correction factor to not include that bar, that box for eight. So in this case, I would add 0.5. So I'd be looking for a probability of 8.5 or more. From here, I can just standardize, right? Can't ever do anything with X on its own. I always have to standardize to a Z. So X to a Z, this guy will always become zero. That is my Z that I'm interested in. How do I calculate it? Always random variable minus the mean divided by my standard deviation. So, okay, Z is going to be 8.5 minus five all over standard deviation of 1.5811. So that's gonna be 3.5 all over 1.5811. That was a five. 5811, what does that work out to? 3.5 divided by 1.5811. I get a Z value of 2.21. Uh, okay, going to my table to look up the probability between my Z and the mean. 2.21, so we go down the left hand side. 2.20, 2.21, I get 0 0.4864. 0 
eight, six, four. Of course, this is not the probability I'm looking for. I'm looking for the red probability. So invoke the fact that this is the median. So hey, this entire half of the distribution is 0 0.5. If that's the case, I'm just looking for that leftover. So 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4864. And that gives me my red area. This guy is 0 0.013. Oh, not a good three. 0 0.0136, so just, just over 1%, but yeah, we see, not so bad. Exact answer, approximation. Not bad, still in that 1% ballpark, but it's a bigger value, right? There's some approximation, there's some error in that, but we get the rough idea. We get the rough idea. Okay, so that is for that guy. Let's take a look at yet another one, right? Lots of examples here, lots of experience working through this. Okay, last one here. 28% of first year students end up dropping out by the end of their second year. What would be the probability of pulling out a sample of 100 first year students and finding that less than 20% of them have dropped out by the end of year two? Okay, so context, and then this last sentence, what would be, that is our question itself. So instantly looking at this, I'm like, wow, we just have proportions everywhere. 28% of first year students, right? That's a proportion of first year students. Then I pull out a sample, 100. So hey, 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 I pull out a sample. And then from that sample, I'm saying, hey, what's the probability that my sample proportion is less than 20%, right? So I'm saying, well, truthfully, I'm saying sample proportion of less than 20%. So, okay, I have my N, I have my sample proportion. What's my population proportion? Well, I'm saying 28% of first year students. So, okay, my population proportion is 28%. So hopefully that screamed at you as well. Hopefully you're able to look at that and say, clearly this is a proportion. There's no language in here about X itself. There's no language in here about a mean. There's no language about a standard deviation. So our only real outcome is a proportion in this scenario, right? In this case here, there's no even raw data, right? If there was raw data, you could calculate the mean. You could calculate the standard deviation and go through, but you don't even have that. So proportion. What we need to check is, okay, is NP is N1 minus P, right? So pi in this case, is this guy greater than or equal to five? Well, that's going to be 28. That'll be 72. So yes, we're good. We can use the normal to look at the distribution of P bar. P bar. Normally distributed, centered around that population proportion pi, which we said was 0 0.28. Standard errors, well, that's going to be the square root of pi, 1 minus pi, all over n. So what's that guy going to be? That's going to be pi is 0 0.28, 0 0.72, all over 100. Great. What's our question? Now we pull out a sample proportion less than 20. So, okay, mean is 28. So 20 would fall somewhere over here. And we're saying, what's the probability that we pull out less than 20? So the highlighted red area is what we're looking for. Again, we can't do anything with the random variable, right? We cannot solve this as it is. We need to standardize. So first step, first step, once we have the initial setup, is to standardize P bar to Z. Once we do that, okay, our mean becomes zero. We need to work out what this guy here is. So we need to find out 
the z value, random variable minus the mean divided by the standard errors. So 0 0.20 minus 0 0.28 all over all that garbly goop there. 0 0.28, 0 0.72, all over 100. So what do I get in the numerator? I get negative 0 0.08. In the denominator, what do I get? I get 0 0.28 times 0 0.72 divided by 100. Take the square root of all that. And my denominator is 0 0.0. Uh, we're going to go for 5. What does that give me? 0 0.08 negative divided by 0 0.045 gives me a Z statistic of 1.77777, so 1 1.78. Okay, now that I have my Z statistic, next step, go to the table work out the probability between these guys here. So jumping to our table. 1.78, so down the left-hand side, 1.7, across, all right, 1.7, all the way across, and we get 1.78.4. Zero point four six two five. Okay, so four six two five, that's this probability. That's not the probability we're looking for. We're interested in the red guy. So again, we use this idea that hey, we're a symmetric distribution. So mean equals median, meaning that between zero and negative infinity is 50%. So hey, 50% minus our yellow. So 0 0.5 minus 0.4625 will give us our red area there. And that red area, this probability will be 0 0.0375. Five or 3.75 percent. Right, so there's only a 3.75 percent chance that less than 20 percent of students have dropped out by the end of year two. So that's the result of this. Or I guess first year students out of these hundred samples. Okay, whole bunch of examples worked through here. We've really worked at everything that we've been able to touch at all of our tools in our toolbox. You see that really once we get to that normal distribution the way we attack it is identical. The problem is figuring out which one to pull out in order to figure out which one you're going to attack the problem with. Am I dealing with a normal approximation of the binomial? Am I dealing just straight up with X being normally distributed? Am I dealing with the distribution of my sample mean, my central limit theorem, X bar being normally distributed? Or am I dealing with the distribution of my sample proportion, P bar, like we just did here? Right? You have to read through the question, you have to interpret what's being happening, and then once you have that, you can go through the flowchart and work out what's going on. Big part for the midterm is being able to differentiate that. We still have one more bit that we're going to cover. We're going to be taking a look at our what would be known as confidence intervals. We'll introduce yet another distribution and yet another tool for you to be utilizing. So that is, as we approach up into the second midterm, we're going to have all of these tools to consider which ones to apply. Once you figure out which tool to apply, that's the hardest part. It's just working through this process. So we'll have a few more tools that we'll introduce next week. But other than that, this is the bread and butter, the working underneath the normal curve that we're using again for the rest of the course. This is the basics of our course. So. If you have any questions, if you have any troubles with that and identifying the right random variable, reach out to me, D2L discussion board, or by email. Till next time.